Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Now to show us something in line with how to make your star shine. Praise God. Because it's supposed to. Tell your neighbor it's supposed to. You're supposed to know how. Praise God. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Let's begin from verses 1. The Bible says, who is the wise man? Who is the wise man? And who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? The Bible says, a man's wisdom, the Bible says, maketh his face to shine. And the boldness of his face shall be changed. Did you hear what I just said? A man's wisdom, the Bible says, it makes his face shine. A man's wisdom, a man's wisdom. Wisdom is the second thing. If you're writing, you're giving a title to this, write wisdom. Praise God. So the Bible has said that who is the wise man and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom, the Bible says, maketh his face to shine. It makes his face to shine. Oh, we're talking about you making your star shine. He says a man's wisdom makes his face to shine. That means that if you walk in the wisdom of God, you'll put a certain brightness on your face. Spiritually. You put a certain brightness on this star. The clock of brightness continues to increase and increase on your life because you carry wisdom. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's almost as though it's obvious, but it's not obvious. I'm going to go deep, so deep and explain what exactly I mean by that. But thank God for wisdom. Tell your neighbors, thank God for wisdom. Now, if the Bible says that the wisdom of a man makes his face shine, It means the less the wisdom of God operating on your life, the more you affect negatively your story and the star that you are before God. When he promised our father Abraham that your descendants shall be as the stars in the sky, of course he knew that we belonged somewhere up there. We don't belong here. We belong somewhere up there. But when we know, or you and I know that we belong somewhere up there, There are things that make us up there shine brighter than others. If you were to stand right now in the sky, in the season where there are stars, you realize that your eye will catch the star that shines most immediately. And how many of you know that that's the same favor by which many of you or us have in the spirit, that when men look at us, even when they have 17 options to choose over, they'll choose you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Because you catch a certain attention. You catch a certain attention. There is something about you. There is something about you. Have you been around people? You reach them. You don't know what to say about them. They might not say much, but there is just something about them. Somebody don't know how to explain that thing. There are people you look at and there is something about them. You don't just love them because they have a nice nose or good eyes. No, there's just something about them. You don't have words to articulate why you like them, but there's just something about them. Praise God. One time I told a story a couple of years ago. I was in the bank. I used to sit upstairs as a supervisor at front office. So this guy came one time upstairs. He looked at me and stared. And then he went away. And I said, again another time he came, looked at me, went away. So for a few days... As he continues to come where we were working to transact, we became friends. And then one time he asked me, are you born again? And I said, yes. He said, you know, every time I would enter this bank, I used to look at you and there is something. (laughs) Somebody said there's something in my life. Yes, yes. The Bible says he is the light that lights every man that comes in this world. He is that light that lights us every man that comes to the world. This world is full of gross darkness. There's already darkness around us. That you are the only light people see. Somebody shout hallelujah. You, you, there's already enough darkness in the world. Enough darkness. When people look at you, they see light. Now, you might think that darkness is the absence 
of physical light. No. You can't be in a place where there's no physical light, but you are lighting in the spirit. And you can't be in a place of too much light, yet there's evil and darkness. How many of you know that Las Vegas is one of the brightest cities on the face of the earth? <laughs> yet everything is in Las Vegas. Gambling, everything mentioned. Sorry if you're in Las Vegas. God changes it in Jesus' name. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's not just the physical light. No, it is that light that God said, let there be in Genesis. And it was. And that's what separates the day and the night. And you are the child of the day. Somebody shout hallelujah. You're children of the day. You're children of the day. So it doesn't matter how much darkness there is. You are the light. So there are people I have met even in life. And there's just something about them. I don't have a name for it. But when you look at them, there's something about them. Some people call it the X Factor. Some people have a name for it. But whatever you want to call it, there's something on you that is special. Tell anybody there's something on me that is special. So he has said that a man's wisdom, your wisdom, it makes his face shine. The wisdom on your life will cause you to shine. Before you even speak it, if you have wisdom on you, something on you shines. The more wise you are, the more something on you shines. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'll give you another scripture. Daniel chapter 12 verses 3. And they that are wise shall shine. And they that are wise shall shine. He says, and them that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They that are wise shall be bright. They shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They that are wise, they that are wise shall shine. I don't know that you get it. I'm trying to... Call out something. He says, they that are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. So wisdom is a guarantee. If you have wisdom, you'll shine. You'll attract favor. There's a glory on your life. There's a certain thing that will open up for you. If they have 12 to choose, you'll be the one in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Like how Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Bible says, came not to be ministered to, but to minister. I mean that he not ministered to him. It only means even though they ministered to him, it wasn't his primary intention to be ministered to. Because his heart was in serving, not to be served. Right? So it is with Luke. Again, the same principle is spoken of the Son of God in Luke 2.40. He says, And the child grew and worked strong in the Spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is Jesus. This is the child grew. And the Bible says, and he walks strong in the spirit. This is Jesus. He walks strong in the spirit. And the Bible says, and he was filled with wisdom. He was filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. That was Jesus. If the son of God needed to be filled with this thing, to attract a certain attention, how can you not need it? Come on, somebody. If the Son of God needed it, how can you not need it? If the Son of God needed it, how can... If the Son of God, if the Son of God needed wisdom, how can you not need it? Oh, if it was important, imperative for Luke to write it, and says he grew and walked strong in the Spirit, filled with wisdom, strong in the Spirit, filled with wisdom, strong in the Spirit, comma, filled with wisdom. Are you seeing where I'm coming from? It's the strength of your Spirit. He says, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times and the strength of your salvation. It is what draws your stability. It is what gives strength to your salvation. It's what makes you a strong Christian. He says, and wisdom, Isaiah 33 verse 6, he says, and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. It will cause you to be stable in every way. And he says, and the strength of your salvation. It will be the strength of your salvation. So you are as strong as you are wise. You are as bright as you are wise. Praise God. When we were growing up, you remember how, when they used to have exceptional students like me and a few of you. Every time you did something, they used to say, ah, this child is bright. 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 Every time you did something wise, every time you did something wonderful, they said, this child is bright. What is the issue of bright? Because... Every sort of wisdom represented on your spirit came like a light. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, of course, some people use it for, for just simply English. Oh, it's bright, bright. You don't even know what bright is. Some people even call their children bright without even knowing what bright is. You understand? 
Somebody shout hallelujah. But the Bible tells us that this is wisdom and knowledge. The wise shall shine. So when they say your child is bright, it means they're wise. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's something they have done that represents a certain light on them. Or because of what they have done, there is a light on their life. And that's why they see bright. You're bright. Your future is bright. There has to be a wisdom on you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let's go a bit deep. Because it's important for you to first understand the preamble. Right? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11 verses 19. Speaks of how the son of man came. This is the boy who works strong in wisdom. Huh? And the Bible says that the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous, and a wine biber, and a friend of publicans and sinners. But, the Bible says, wisdom is justified of her children. Wisdom is justified of her children. Let me explain that. Give me the amplified of that. The Amplified says, so the Son of Man came eating and drinking with others. And they say, oh, a glutton and a wine drinker, a friend of tax collectors, and especially wicked sinners. Yet, the Bible says, wisdom, yet, you see, they could call him a tax, a guy who eats with the tax collectors is wicked. They could call him a wine biber or wine drinker. They could call him gluttonous. He eats a lot. He eats with the wicked. He's all these kind of things. They can't call you anything in this world. But, the Bible says, Wisdom is justified and vindicated by what she does, her deeds, and by her children. Now, Matthew is trying to open us to some here. That it does not matter what people call you. It doesn't matter what people think you are. It doesn't matter what people conclude you to be. There is one thing in this life, regardless of how many accusations are on your life, there is one thing that can vindicate you in this life. It's called the wisdom of God. It is the vindicator of the righteous. Some of you work in places and say, ah, you're a thief. Oh, you're going to hear things in this world about you, about people, some of which things don't even make sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? And of course, people are funny. Everything they hear is, I don't know whether they just want it to be true, or it's in their nature to be simple. I think it's simplicity. It's just simplicity. You understand what I'm saying? Some of you, you are at your workplaces and then you walk up and a funny accusation comes up. You don't even know where it came from. Somebody saw it say, say, say. Did I say? Yes, they said that you said it. Next thing you know, you see, anything can happen in this world. You can be against, they can be against you, sorry. Things can come against the course of your life. They will go directions you never want to be. Men will hate you without cause. Men will speak things about you. People will call you things you don't even know or have never done. We, some of us have been taken to hell and back. Some people saw us signing checks with the devil. I don't know how. You understand what I'm saying? But you see, they can speak everything they'll speak. But wisdom is our justifier. Because see, God and wisdom are one and the same. It's what gives us stability. Now this is the son of God. He, Jesus Christ, the boy which works strong in the spirit, who was full of wisdom. The Bible says, they looked at him and they said, this guy is a wine drinker. He eats with the wicked. He's this and that. In some personal scripture, they call him <laughs> a prince of devils, right? It's something like that. He, he's, he's, he's Beelzebub. He's a prince of demons. He, he, he leads legions of spirits. I don't know whose vision that was. Praise God. Anything can be said on you. And I'm trying to tell you, to actually free you, that anything can and will be said about you. But never be found to lack wisdom. See, even if a man is that good, but he starts to speak or act a certain way in which there is no wisdom, already that man has disqualified himself from a certain course. You understand what I'm saying? Let them say anything about you, but let them never question the wisdom of God upon your life. Because it is your ultimate vindication. You understand what I'm saying? It's your ultimate vindication. It was the vindicator of the Son of God. Yes, he eats with the wicked. He's a friend to the sinners. He's a wine drinker, gluttonous fellow. Speak all you want. But there's a wisdom that justifies. And the Bible says that wisdom is justified and vindicated by what she does. 
and by her children. That means Jesus, which is our wisdom, our redemption, and sanctification. How many of you know that? That Jesus is our wisdom, our redemption, and sanctification. Of, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That is Jesus. He's our wisdom. Now, when we go back to the scripture where it says that wisdom is vindicated or is justified by her deeds and by her children. It means, it doesn't matter what they will ever um, brand the church. It doesn't matter how many names they will ever give the church. As long as the church of Jesus Christ sustains a certain level of wisdom, the church will stand. Somebody shout hallelujah. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. The church has been persecuted for centuries. But it is still here. You understand what I'm saying? It is still here. Recently I heard they are banning Bibles from uh, public schools or this and that and in some European nations. They can do all they want. It has been the top selling book ever since it was printed. And it was the first book in record to be printed. The Bible. You chase it out of hospitals and schools. Do all you want. Praise God. It will find a man in the cell. You understand what I'm saying? The children will will become funny and they'll get on drugs and some of them will be taken to prison. And when they're in prison, the Bible will find them there. You can't run away from the word. Somebody shout hallelujah. You cannot run away from the word because the word is a convictor. You remember when Paul uh, was on his way to Damascus and Jesus appears to him. He asks him, why do you kick against the pricks? That means that the word of God is a convictor. It pricks. Even to the one who is, he was there, he was watching everything. When Stephanos was being beaten, he was watching it all. He was persecuting. But what we did not know was spiritually, the Lord was pricking him. You understand it? That's why when you talk to some people about Jesus, they want to kill you. Don't tell me about that. Because you see, everything you start to speak, the pricking thing on their spirit. That's the power of the word. It can prick. Praise the Lord Jesus. It convicts men of sin. Somebody shout Amen. Now, back to the story. So they speak of a situation where the Son of God, yes, he can be called anything. But he says, this is our justification. This is his justification. That there's a wisdom on his life. And that wisdom causes him to do certain things a certain way. And that's the same wisdom that will vindicate her children. The wine biber, the gluttonous man, the wicked man they call. He is the man who dies for the sins of the world. He's the propitiation of our sins. He's the man that lays down his life and sheds his blood for you and I to be saved. So, at the end of the day, no matter what men called him, what he did has brought many sons to glory. That's wisdom. That's why the Bible says that they that are wise win souls. It's wisdom to win men. So the end of Jesus is not the alcohol they say he drank or the gluttonous thing. It's the end that we see that God had a bigger plan through this man to save you and I. And as long as the world is from the beginning up to the end, it's the most powerful thing that has ever been done by a man in the body. That is die for the sins of you and I. That is Jesus Christ. And he knew no sins. It is God in the flesh 100%. He did not sin. He knew no sin. We're not about men who have sinned and also died for others. No. We're talking about a man who knew no sin but became sin. That you being dead and two sins might live unto righteousness. Those are the stripes that heal you. The propitiation of your peace is upon that same man. He's doing everything on the face of the earth. Men call him gluttonous, wine Bible, whatever it is. But he has a bigger plan of wisdom to serve the world. And he says, this is his justification. And the justification of all the children of wisdom, you and I, our justification is the end in the Lord. The things that men see and can confirm that there was a wisdom of God functioning on our lives. Somebody shout hallelujah. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 8, he says, And to me, who am least of all saints, he says, is given the grace that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And he says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus. And the Bible says, To the intent, now listen, to the intent, it has been hid, to the intent, now unto all the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. 
He's saying there was some that was hid from the ages first and now it is revealed through you. Paul is speaking it to make all men see the fellowship of that mystery. Which was hid from the beginning of the world. By Jesus who creates all things. And this thing that was hid is being manifested as Paul preaches it to the church. And this is to the intent that the principalities, the demons, the powers, the rulers of this world, everything that is against the church, it will bow to see the manifold wisdom of God as the church demonstrates it. That means the wisdom of God is the highest power of demonstration by the church of Jesus Christ against the principalities, the powers, the rulers and dominions and wicked spirits in high places. Who has understood what I just said? That's why the Bible calls him Christ, both the power and the wisdom of God. It is your vindicator. Wisdom is your vindicator. He's your vindication and justification, regardless of what you are called. But also more than that, it is the one thing that God has promised, that principalities, powers, rulers in high places learn off from the church. That means when you hear a sick person, principalities see the wisdom of God. When you raise a dead man, principalities see the wisdom of God. When you open a deaf ear, principalities see the wisdom of God. When you heal a cancer, principalities see the wisdom of God. When you build ministry, principalities see the wisdom of God. They don't have it. For had they known these things, this wisdom, the Bible says they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That is why men turn themselves against the course of truth. Because if they had known truth, they would not have crucified him. Says, I'll beat this wisdom. We speak this wisdom, but in a mystery. Not the words of men. He says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Give me the amplified of that. He says, rather, we're setting forth a wisdom of God, once hidden from the human understanding, and now revealed to us by God, that wisdom, the Bible says, which God devised and decreed before the ages for our glorification, to lift us into glory, the glory of His presence. He kept a certain wisdom away for you. When he was releasing things on the earth, he kept a certain wisdom for you. And when you came, put your name. He put it on you. Hallelujah. And then he said, this is for your glorification. To lift you into the glory of his presence. Can you imagine the glory of his presence? Just imagine for a second the glory of his presence. And the next verse says, and says none of the rulers of this age, all this world, perceived and recognized and understood this. For if they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. You know why they would have believed on him? If they had seen this wisdom, they would not have crucified Jesus. But rather, they would have followed him. That means the fact that you are here, you have seen Christ, the wisdom, and the power of God. You understand? They couldn't harm him. The evil one cannot harm him. Even the devil would not have killed him. If he understood this wisdom. That means, the reason why the devil turns course against God is because there is a wisdom he did not have. If he had that wisdom, he would not have even rebelled against God. And guess what? One third of the angelics fell with a man. That's huge. Imagine you have a million angels in heaven. One third of that fell with Satan. One third fell with Satan. One third fell with Satan. You understand what I'm saying? It's about what? If a million, that's 300 and what? 25,000? Something like that. All of us fell with this stupid fellow. They were all stupid. But thank God you're wise. That is why you received Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, he has said that this same wisdom is what we use when we are addressing principalities, powers, and dominions. They know of the many-sidedness, the manifold wisdom, the multi-paradigm thing about the wisdom of God. It's, it's multi. It's, it's not just one-dimensional. It's not one-dimensional. It's, it's multi-dimensional. Manifold wisdom, it means the many-sidedness of the wisdom of God. That means that the wisdom of God, once it sits on you, you're this endless thing that always knows everything in every way and every how and who and when and whichever way you have. Somebody say, I have an answer. I have an action. Say, I know all things. That's the wisdom of God on your life. That's the wisdom of God on your life. That's the wisdom of God in your life. That's the wisdom of God in your life. You will know. You will know. You, in every, whatever they mention, you'll have an idea. 
Praise God. Whatever they talk about, you'll have a story. Whatever they speak about, it will be somewhere in the back there. And it comes out. Hallelujah. That's the household. The Bible says, for out of it flows both old and new things. It, it flows the present things. The, the things that are present are there. But when they dig inside you, hallelujah, you are like one which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven, the realm of heaven. He says, they said unto them, therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like one unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. That means when they bring the oldest wisdom, them, it's somewhere in there. When they bring the newest stuff, it's somewhere in there. They cannot take you back or forth and you don't have an answer. You never minister questions. Somebody shout hallelujah. Some are minister of answers. I don't minister questions to the hearts of my hearers. But I minister answers that are to godly edification. Shout hallelujah if you believe it. I minister answers. I tell myself every day I have answers. I don't stop to tell myself that I have answers for men. I have answers. I have answers and they can't stop coming. Why? Because I have answers. I can never run out of answers. Why? Because Jesus is, he's, he's the wisdom. He's the source. He's Jesus endless. Uh-uh. The Bible calls them the bottomless things of God. Hallelujah. If they are bottomless, then I am bottomless. Hallelujah. If they are endless, then I'm endless. I can never run out. The present things are with me like the ancient ones. Hallelujah. Somebody shout Hallelujah. It's the same thing that the principalities look to. It's the same thing that shakes the rulers of this world. It's the same thing that shakes the devils of this world. Demons are not tormented by your prayer. Demons are tormented by the wisdom in your prayer. Demons are not tormented by your praise. Demons are tormented by the understanding in your praise. Demons are not tormented by your worship. Demons are tormented by the revelation in your worship. It's what draws the difference. You look at men in scripture and the Bible says and they are in prison. And the Bible says and they start praising God. Are you hearing me? And what happens? The Bible says the prison gets what? They break open. Why? Because the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. And he could not fit in the prison. And he had to fix it up. <laughs> but not everybody who praises God in the prison cell. God an answer. No. Some have and they've died there. Asking him to come by here, Lord. Come by here, Lord. Come by here. Right? The Bible says, I will worship in understanding. In understanding. With the understanding and in understanding. With the understanding and in understanding. You understand what I'm saying? You both know what you are worshipping. What it means and who you are worshipping. The Bible says in understanding. Be what? Be mature. In malice be babes. But how be it in understanding? The Bible says be what? Be mature. Be mature when it comes to understanding. Be men. He says, brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice? Be children, but in understanding, be men. Be mature. Be grown. Fully grown. When it comes to understanding, in understanding, be men. Be mature. That's why he wants the church. We don't just wake up and say, oh, no. We, we don't just sing, oh, no. I remember when growing up and demons, uh, one time was somewhere, and then somebody was tormented by devils. And then somebody got scared. And out of here said, start singing. Or else the demons will enter you. Start singing. Or else the demons will enter Then people start singing because they don't want the demons to enter. <laughs> That's not worship in understanding. That's worship in fear. And you have not received the spirit of fear. But you have received the spirit of love, power, and sound mind. That's why I me mean when I'm scared, I don't worship. No. I first deal with fear. Then I worship. I rebuke that spirit. I command you to go in the mighty name of Jesus. Then I believe it's gone. Then I start worshiping God. Hallelujah. That's the wisdom from above. It is pure. Firstly, the Bible says the wisdom from above is pure. That means it does not carry any carnality. And it's peaceable. And gentle. And easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits without personality and without hypocrisy. It is peaceable. There is a peace when you carry the wisdom of God. You walk in a certain peace. When you find a man under peace, that's a man with a certain wisdom. You know something. 
Confidence is silent. Insecurity is allowed. If you want to know men who are insecure, find people every time I explain. When a man knows who he is, hallelujah, you get in the midst of the storm and just have peace. Praise God. They look at you and they don't even know what. They, you don't look like you should have peace. But you have it. Why? Because you know some. You know something. You know who is with you. You know who is for you. You know the end of this thing. Hallelujah. You know where it's going. That's a man who has faith. That's a man who has understood God. When a man carries wisdom, wise men, there's a way they are peaceable. There's a way they don't respond carnally. That's the purity. In fact, the word there, the wisdom that is from above, is firstly pure. The word there for pure is without kind of interactions. That's what he calls purity. It's set apart from carnality. Regardless of the situation around you, don't act carnal. Don't act like a man in the flesh. Some people, it's very easy to push them to be in carnal. You do something to them and say, I'm going to show you my true colors. Do you want me to show you? Do you do you, then they start folding there. Do you, I'm going to show you my true color. I thought your true color was love. That's a true color of wise men. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is gentle. Do you know what it's like to get in an argument and somebody, ah, they're screaming over their head and just like, no, it is not right. <laughs> but then you find the Christian loudest. Many years ago, many, many years ago, I used to go into these little fellowships to pray. And then one of those times, a certain woman had an issue with another friend of hers. Old women, they were old. I was then probably 19. So as this Christian brother who saw these sisters fighting. And then I took them together in just one place. And I said, you people, can't you make peace? Just, I wanted to reconcile them. Huh? And then one said, you know me, I'm willing to make peace. Uh, but this person is this and that and that and that. Then, as she's trying to explain her issue, the other one they're talking about stood up and said, Can I beat you now? <laughs> Guess what I did? <laughs> I, I'm sure some of you never watched the cartoon called Roadrunner. <laughs> can I beat you now? She stood up. I said, Can I beat you now? That's not wisdom. Somebody shout hallelujah. How do you respond when you're under pressure? How do you respond when you are annoyed? When men flip you. Some of you, that's why you can't keep jobs. You can't keep jobs because you don't even have the wisdom to keep quiet. Wait, wait, oh God. You don't talk to me like that. <laughs> Must you win every fight? Do you know it's weakness to explode? Do you know it's weakness? Some of you think it's strength. Then you find a Christian. Then you find them in a t-shirt. Fanero. Make manifest. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. I urge you by God. Any form of carnality is a derivation of the course of the wisdom of God. Praise God. Don't act like one without wisdom. Because you kill your star. You kill your star. You kill your star. Let's go deeper. When David met Bathsheba, he told her that your son shall come after me as king. And there are many, many things that transpired through that process as David is growing old, you know the story, to the time when he's almost dying, to the point where he ordained Solomon as king. You remember that? Now, the Bible tells us somewhere, Solomon was a servant of David. He wasn't just a son. If you remember when Adonijah had gone to claim kingship, the Bible says all the sons of the king have gone with Adonijah, but only your servant Solomon has stayed. Your servant. He was a servant to David. Even though he was a son, he was a servant to David. It's like I'm a man of God, right? My children are not going to serve God after me because they were my children. But because they served the ministry. 
Because there's a difference between their father, biological, and the man of God. You understand? That's why many pastors miss it. They think that their children automatically are going to carry mantles. That's why many pastors' children are not serving God. Because they think that their children are automatically going to carry the mantles. Because they think they're just going to inherit the gene that loves God. No, 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 no. It's an experience. And your child has to experience God themselves. You have to teach your children to serve their God. You have to tell them that because you're my child, they mean that you're supposed to walk and function in the way that I am. No. You have to find God yourself. You have to experience Him yourself. You have to go through the principles and patterns like the Bible teaches yourself and see God yourself. They are not preferred because they are my family. They are preferred because they have a relationship with God. You understand what I'm saying? The church of Jesus is not just uh, like some they inherit. No, 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 no. It's a responsibility from heaven. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, you remember that story of Solomon. Now, there are many things David did not teach Solomon. Many. In fact, he taught him to fight. That's one of them. There are many, many things David did not teach Solomon. Many. Because, of course, he had many children. And how do you know that? It's how he lacks basic wisdom when he becomes king. He went after women. And the Bible says they diverted his heart from the Lord. That's what they do. They take you from the Lord. You understand? There are many things, of course, the Bible says that Solomon brought in other gods. He started worshipping the gods of those women. His father never taught him how to worship. Yet he was a man after God's own heart. The man after God's own heart never taught his son how to worship God a certain way. Even he as David, because he was not taught by Jesse how to be a son. And I also don't blame David at a particular point. Right? Because you're raised by a man called Jesse. You're looking after animals. You're killing animals. You're killing bears and lions. And you can't tell Jesse. Because Jesse can't see the light on you. And the first man to see the light on you is Saul. And that Saul man who sees the light on you, he doesn't see that light on you to love you for who you are. He loves you for what you are and what you can do for him. And how do we know that? When you start to kill 10,000 men, his countenance changes against you. Yet when you could kill a thousand, he was okay with that. When you kill the Philistines, he gives you Michal to marry. You understand what I'm saying? Yet after a few days later, his countenance wants to kill you. He doesn't care whether his child is going to be a, a widow. He would rather kill you because the souls don't understand love. They have a very mixed understanding and definition of love. Yet the scriptures say, and Saul loved David. But what do you mean, Saul, when you say you love a man who you are willing to kill for killing your enemies? So they have a very mixed understanding of what love is. This is fathers to sons. It's not sons to fathers. This is fathers to sons. Why do you love your children? Do you love them because they can do things for you? Do you love them because of what they are? Or do you really love them because you love them? But how could Saul love David when he had not encountered God a certain way? Because God is love. And that also goes to the degree of how much the man has experienced God. If you're not going to experience God a certain way, you cannot walk in love. It's like people who lie themselves, oh, we are going to get married, I'm going to be happy. How are you going to be happy? How are you even going to be, I I love you. What, What is love when you don't know God? Any other love you're defining is human. It is sensual, it's carnality. And it, the Bible calls, it, Paul classified those things as the things that are done with their doing. You understand what I'm saying? So they marry after two weeks and they look at each other and like, okay, but, but why, why did we marry again? Huh? Because it's not agape. It's human love. You understand what I'm saying? Some people think it's just enough. No, no, it's more than that. Tell me about it's more than that. It's more than what you feel. Hallelujah. Marriage is more than you. That is why when you went there, you committed. So, David served Saul. And I don't want you to miss this. David served Saul. Right? And the same man wants to kill him. So, David didn't know how to father. He fathers a boy who didn't... He also didn't know how to father him. Because he wasn't fathered. And Solomon is funny. Robo, I mean, the list is endless. Actually, Israel split because of Solomon. The wisest man. Hello? But it is because there are things that were not taught him. But there are things that were taught him also. He was taught to war. Right? 
But also, he was taught something. Let's open Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. If you're there, you say, Amen. Begin from verses 3. Now, this is Solomon speaking about his father. I was my father's son. Tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Right? Why do they call him tender and beloved in the sight of his mother? Because he was the only son of the mother. But Sheba never had any other children. So he says, he taught me also. He taught me. He taught him to walk, but he also taught him. He also taught him. There's one thing. There's one other thing besides fighting. There's one more thing he taught. There's one more thing David taught his son, Solomon. Now, remember he was tender. He was a young boy. That means he wasn't speaking to an adult. No, he didn't have time for that. But he had a little, while David was young, young, very young, he, the Bible says he taught him also and said unto him, let your heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and leave. And the next verse says, get wisdom. Do you, you see what he told? He told the man, get wisdom. Solomon. I might not be here with you to teach you every other day, but I'll teach you this one thing. I can teach you to fight, but I will teach you wisdom. Besides, you don't need much to fight later because you're a man who enjoys peace. Remember, the Bible says the days of Solomon were days of peace. But there's one thing David used to tell his boy. He told him, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Never decline from the words of my mouth. Don't decline. Now, fast forward, mystery. First Kings chapter 3, Solomon gives a sacrifice to God. And when he gives a sacrifice to God, the Bible says he goes into a deep sleep. Right? And when he was in sleep, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. I want you to know that God did not transact with Solomon when he was awake. God transacted with Solomon when he was in a dream. And what do the dreams come? The Bible says the Lord brings these dreams, one, to rob man of his own what? Purpose and pride. So that you don't look like you have a physical purpose in it and the pride to boast that you did it. That's prevenient grace. It is the operation of God working through you to give the answer. But again, it's what is within you. Now, David tells Solomon, get wisdom. It was an instruction in his spirit. Get wisdom. Because there's a time where God is going to appear to this boy fast forward. Many years. And he asks him what? He, he, remember, he, he appeared to him in Gibeon in a dream. He, do you understand what I'm saying? Get wisdom. And the guy keeps it in his heart. He didn't get it that day. He didn't get it that day. But he got the instruction of the father. Get wisdom. That means, what a father plants in a child defines the child's prayer in future at the point when they come in contact with God. Did you get it? When you talk, when the Bible says raise up your child in the way they should go, when they grow up they will not depart. What you are speaking to them is what they will present before God one day by prevenience when God appears to them. But deeper than that, you can see the power of a parent planting a seed in their child. Get wisdom. What David spoke then would be the answer when God asks Solomon, what do you want? It's as though the voice of David speaks in the boy's spirit and tells him, get Who has understood what I just said? So, Solomon, it was planted in his spirit. It was in there. But he didn't know when it was going to come to manifestation. So at Gibeon, the Bible says the Lord appears and to what? And to him by a dream in the night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. And the Bible says, and Solomon said, thou hast showed mercy unto my, thy servant David. You see, this is a man in a dream. But prevenient grace goes back to the line of the man after God's own heart. The thing in his spirit, I don't know whether you're cutting this thing. The thing in his spirit cannot ignore the man who is responsible for this. He says, and to thy servant David, my father, you gave great mercy according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And the Bible says, and now, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father. And I'm but a little child and I know not how to go out or go in. This is a man in a dream. That means that the instruction David gave him 
would work in his spirit later to communicate to God what was necessary to be asked for. Because what you tell your child goes in their soul. It goes in their spirit. And later it defines the deepest conversations with their God. That's powerful. That's why we preach to you. When I'm speaking to you right now, I'm defining how you're going to pray. When I'm talking to you, every Thursday we teach you. Are you hearing me? We are aligning your spirits to pray the right way. When God appears to you, you know how to pray. You know how to believe. You know how to respond. When disease comes, you know what to do with it. When temptation comes, you know what to do with it. When trials come, you know what to do with it. That works from your subconscious part of you. The spiritual you that is so connected to the words that were spoken to you while your brain. That is why some of you, you respond to things without even thinking, but you respond the right way. Why? Because you are taught the right word. So you don't underestimate the words you are being spoken to every Thursday. For these words, they are spirit. And their lives, their plantings, their seedlings coming into you. And they're being planted and they're sprouting into the results that will come through you later. That is why sometimes all you have to do is just sit and listen. Things might not make sense, but don't stop listening. Hallelujah. Don't stop beholding like in a mirror. The Bible says, and we behold like in a mirror. Like we behold, we continue. He says, if we continue, give me the amplified. He says, but all of us as with unveiled face... Because, because, listen, because we continue to behold in the word. We don't just see once and then we don't see and then we come to church tomorrow and then the other Thursday you don't come and then the other Sunday you pray and the other Sunday you don't pray and sometimes when you have time, oh, I post I came, oh, sorry, I didn't come. You see, that's why you're suffering. That's why you're striving. That's why I think, oh, but there are people I know who are always here and they're, they're still striving. Yes, yes, they might be striving, but give it time. The difference will be drawn very clearly. Because they might not see the results yet, but they are investing in eternity. And it's only a matter of time the lines will fall unto them in pleasant places. And things will start working. Because God has promised that all of us with unveiled faith, because, 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 we continue to behold in the word of God. That's the difference between them and you. Because for them, they have a promise. You, you don't. They are present with a promise. Your absence without. He says, as in a mirror, the glory of God, of the Lord. Somebody said, we are, present continuous, constantly being transfigured into his very own image. In ever increasing splendor. From one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. That means that as you continue listening to this word. Physically something might not be changing on you. But inside you there are things. There are transactions in your spirit. That are, they are constantly changing you. So a few words David tells Solomon. We do not know later that they were going to define the future of this boy. That means the man after God's own heart. Knew what was in his boy and what the boy needed. Are you following me? So he says, give your servant an understanding heart that I may know how to rule your people well. And the speech pleased the Lord and that Solomon had asked this thing. And the Bible says, and God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies. Now, I want you to see those three things. Those were the three things Solomon would have asked for if he was awake. If Solomon was awake, Now, God is telling him what he didn't ask for. That means there was a presupposition that he was going to ask for. That. He knew the heart of the man in the flesh. And he knew the heart of the man in the spirit. Then he chooses to come to this man in a dream. Because he knows if I come to him during day with a physical brain, he might forget the teaching and instruction of the father and what the father told him to get. And he will ask for long life, for the glory of his enemies, and riches for himself. And the Bible says... But thou hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. The Bible says, Behold, I have done up into thy words, and have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before, neither after thee shall arise any. And guess what? When Solomon became wise, everything came. Now, let's go back to Proverbs. He tells him, in verses um, 5, He says, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. 
Neither decline from the words of my mouth. These are things, and remember how many Proverbs did Solomon write? More than four, five, five thousand? Now the Bible says, forsake her not. He's talking of wisdom. Forsake her not. If you don't forsake, if you don't forsake her, she shall preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. That means when you have the wisdom of God, you don't worry about being destroyed. You'll be preserved. Oh, oh, give me the amplified of that. He says, forsake not wisdom and she will keep, defend, and protect you. That's what wisdom does. Woo! She will defend, she will keep, she will protect you, love her, and she will guard you. She became a whore. This is what Solomon was really supposed to marry. Now, listen. The next verse says, the beginning of wisdom is get wisdom. That means it begins when you get it. It says in James, let him that lacks wisdom ask. If you like it, ask. For he giveth to men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Get it! So he goes back and says, this is the beginning of wisdom. Get wisdom, skillful and godly wisdom. For skillful and godly wisdom is the principal thing. He says, and with all you have gotten, get understanding. That is discernment, comprehension, interpretation. That means understanding helps you to interpret the wisdom you've gotten. That's why you need understanding. Because there is those which carry a wisdom that they cannot interpret. They speak things. They start speaking and they look so deep. But their life does not carry the interpretation of the things they claim to speak. So they cannot manifest what they claim to know. That's a man with wisdom but without the very understanding. So it tells you get understanding. It means get grace to design, comprehend and interpret what is revealed to you as skillful wisdom, Sophia, the mother of all wisdoms. It's not just enough for you to be wise. It's important to carry the revelation, the understanding, the interpretation of the wisdom God has given you. That's what completes you. And the next verse says, prize wisdom. Listen, this is him telling his son. Prize wisdom highly and exalt her. How do you prize wisdom and exalt her? By investing in her. You cannot tell a woman you prize her, you exalt her without investing in her. He's saying prize highly. He's saying wisdom is like a woman. You understand? He says highly, prize, 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 as in put wisdom far. Don't take wisdom like something normal. When you meet a man of wisdom, what do you do? Are you hearing me? When John the Baptist met Jesus, he says, for I must decrease and he must increase. For he that is coming after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. How do you respond to people who are wise? How do you respond to what gives you wisdom? How do you respond to, if you find a book that carries wisdom, how do you respond to it? How do you respond to someone who gives you wisdom? You understand what I'm saying? Some of you have jobs, have bosses at work, who sometimes call you and invest in you a few minutes and tell you, you know, this is how you do it. That's a man who has extended wisdom to you. Prize them. Respect them. So, oh, this is how you do it, okay? Then you, you don't even say thank you. you don't even, some of you don't even have courtesy, basic common decency to say thank you. You understand? If you have a supervisor at your workplace and you know that one time they, you know, they had to shift you to another table and then they trained you, they could have been the hardest, worst, most fakest supervisors in the world. Even in their anger, they were adding to you. Yes, that woman taught me with an attitude. Can you believe she used to abuse me because she was jealous I was seated on the table? But she taught you, right? Yes. Get a little gift. Wrap it. Buy a very nice little gift and put it and say, thank you for the wisdom. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. Even them that teach you, Galatians 6, 6, right? He says, communicate to them that teach you in all good things. If a man has blessed you, bless them. It's not big. You don't need it. No, they are wise enough to survive. Come on. Now at this level, do you think I can be poor with what I know? No. 
If Solomon wasn't broke, and one with greater wisdom is come, ah, uh, ah, uh, chite. But do you understand what I'm saying? Prize, prize wisdom. Prize wisdom, prize wisdom. Prize wisdom. If somebody says something and you feel they've given you wisdom, wherever you are, bless them and say thank you for the wisdom that you've added upon my spirit. I honor wisdom that much that I honor everything that gives it to me. We paid radio programs for men because they spoke wisdom for us. A man speaks wisdom and you pay radio programs. You don't even know you, he'll never meet you. But why? You're investing in what you want to attract. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you know what some people do? They abuse the same thing that gives them wisdom. And they think they can never become wiser. You will never become wiser. Because you've trodden on what you want to attract. Hello? So it says, prize wisdom, I and exalt her. She will exalt and promote you. She will promote you. She will bring you to honor when you embrace her. You see all of these things? Promotion. Men who are promoted at workplaces. Mm, wisdom. Men who carry a certain honor. Mm, wisdom. When you embrace her. And the next verse says, she shall give to your head a rest of gracefulness. A crown of beauty and glory will she deliver to you. Wisdom will get glory and give you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. How does the next verse say? He says, hear O my son and receive my sayings. And the years of your life shall be many. So you see, he has also guaranteed you live long. <laughs> All of this is because of her. Next verse. And he says, I have taught you in the way of skillful and godly wisdom, which is comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God. I have led you into the paths of uprightness. And he says, and when you walk, your steps shall not be hampered. Your path will be clear and open. And when you run, you shall not stumble. And the next verse says, take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Praise God. Enter not into the path of wicked and not go, go, into, no, go not into the way of, 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 of what? And then later in verses 18, the same chapter, he says the path of the just. Same chapter. After introducing wisdom to this boy, he tells him the path of the just is as a shining light. And he says that shineth more and more and more and more and to a perfect day. That's when now he tells him the path of the just. But he is just through wisdom. You understand what I'm saying? Like your justification is by Christ. Which is your wisdom? You understand what I'm saying? Prize it. Invest in wisdom. Don't, don't, don't take wisdom lightly. Some people don't want to invest in wisdom. No. They just want, you pray, pray apostle, what do you see in the spirit? Huh? What? Two. Then they fall down. And, and then you just want to, what do you see? What do you see? I see wisdom. The church of Jesus Christ is not a shrine where you just come for a miracle and then walk away. Oh yes, we have miracles. Oh yes, we do signs, miracles, and wonders. Oh yes, we demonstrate power. But that is not the reason why you come. You can receive your healing even at home. You think some of you can't be live streaming? But because you have the option to come, you still come physically. I'm not saying everybody who is live streaming is wrong. No, some are live streaming because they can't come. And some are live streaming because they're just too lazy to come. And some are live streaming because they're too far not to come. But you come because you want to enjoy a certain atmosphere. And that atmosphere is defined by wisdom. If it's healing, you can receive it even from home. Hallelujah. Invest in wisdom. Tell your neighbor, invest in wisdom. I want you to get to your feet. I want to pray for somebody. Raise your hands right now in the heavens. The power of God is here. I'm speaking something into your spirit that will cause you to answer when the Lord asks you what you need.
in about 15 seconds from now was I see the spirit of God is touching somebody to this knowledge and wisdom God opens your spirit to wisdom He is your wisdom When you ask for wisdom you ask for Christ And when you ask for Christ you ask for the anointing David was anointed like Saul was anointed king but the difference was that he had a certain heart toward God Some of you God is drawing a distinction on your life yes men are anointed start to receive it right now Power of the Ghost Can you talk to God personally right now Let the ruins come to life in the beauty of your name rising up from the ashes God forever you reign And my soul will find refuge In the shadow of your wings So I will love you forever Forever I say Let the ruins come to life In the beauty of your name Rising up from the earth, come forever, and my soul will find a refuge in the shadow of your wings. I will love you forever, forever, I'll stay. I decree upon your life that wisdom is yours and she will promote you she will keep you she will defend you she will give you long life she will give grace to you she will give glory to you she will introduce you before men that are of substance and keep you far from those that hate you she will guard and protect you she will preserve you always the lord has promised that they that are wise shall shine as the brightness of firmament he says that a man's wisdom causes his face to shine and may you shine may your light shine and may the world know that you're truly God as he is yours give the lord a mighty hand clap of praise come on clap your hands to jesus the message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International for more information contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at fenero at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.